Okay, I think it's time to start our speaker session with. Um, so again, welcome everyone for joining a week five speaker session with unit masters. So it's almost Christmas and it's also the only one week left until we finish with the cohort. So uh, congratulations uh, to everyone who is still here and we're still learning. Um, and you potentially have noticed that initially we were supposed to have Maxim uh, joining us, but then Maxim had an emergency. So Matt kindly stepped up and is going to give a presentation um, instead. So Matt is from Gaia Gives and is he is an industrial designer turned permaculturalist and green energy entrepreneur. As a true jack of all trades, Mac works at the intersection of product design and marketing in an attempt to create regenerative structures that can scale. So Matt, really, really great having you here. And I will pass the mic over to you. All right, awesome. Thanks for the introduction. Yeah, Maxim and I are always competing over who gets to talk, so I'm so stoked to be here. And, and thanks for everyone for joining on this call. I think before I, I, draw, I jump into like Web3 and, and the broader topics, maybe just a little about me, because I'm, I'm not like the typical Web3 entrepreneur type. Uh, she mentioned I have a, a background in industrial design. So my first company was actually making physical products, shipping those out, get, building customers, you know, building the conventional um, startup. And it was it was quite a journey. Uh, I was working in uh, green energy technology, solar cooking, off-grid refrigeration, batteries. And the whole goal was like, how can we make people more self-sufficient and give more agency to our customers to live a better life? And in this journey, I ended up finding that um, the type of change that I wanted to create in the world was difficult to scale with physical products. So I was on the search for what else what could be next? And uh, in some ways, Web3 found me. So I ended up moving to Costa Rica and running into the Giveth team. Uh, so Giveth, they're, uh, they're one of the first like crowd giving platforms for the strong Web3 foundation. So they allow, um, they're, they've basically built, um, they allow for donations in Ethereum, thus the name Giveth. They've also uh, developed unique staking opportunities for donors so they can earn what they call give backs on their donations. So my, my co-founder Maxim and I were really inspired by what was going on there. But I also, having come from a more traditional startup background, saying, well, well there are other problems to solve in philanthropy. I, I think we can do more. Um, and I've actually written up a bit of a, uh, a manifesto on how uh, if Web3 can start serving uh, user needs more and start looking at things, you know, keep the aspirations for decentralization and putting agency in the hands of the community members, but also start solving problems more directly in user friendly ways like more traditional startups do. That might be what we really need to scale a Web3 into a broader populace. Yeah, so um, when it comes to the structure of this call, I, I mean, I could just do a long lecture. Are we going to have a QA and a at the end? Sorry, I'm coming in a little fresh. Uh, yeah, Matt. So essentially, um, normally the way it works, um, a speaker has a presentation. Um, this is normally um, 20 to 40 minutes long. And then mm -hmm. uh, we have a Q&A with the students. Okay, sounds good. Yeah, so and I imagine have, have the students had any exposure to the regenerative finance space yet? So we haven't had um, kind of much about regenerative finance on the course. Um, it was more mm -hmm. kind of other blockchain uh, related topics. Um, but yeah, maybe in the chat, someone can say if they've had any experience, but for now would assume that most people are very new to the regenerative finance space. Okay, cool. Yeah, to me, this is my favorite part of, uh, of Web3, to be honest. It's like, how can we collectively coordinate to benefit society as a whole? How do we collectively manage um, commons? You know, things that often that we think of, you know, the, the common analogy, the tragedy of the commons, that if, if the ownership or responsibility is distributed amongst a large number of people, then 
um, things can go south. But on the other hand, if everyone has skin in the game and there's new systems for coordination, it gives p new potential opportunities for us to make the world a much more better and just place. And I know there are a lot of, um, the whole refi term is relatively new. I think the hashtag itself is probably less than a year old. And it really came into, I think it's fullest at uh, ETH Barcelona this summer where Manu from Doing Good was the guest curator and really put an emphasis on bringing in uh, organizations that are trying to use these new mechanisms for, for good. So a common regenerative finance projects often look at, tok or at uh, carbon. And so how are new ways we can coordinate and put prices on carbon or putting um, a price on other positive externalities. So like recycling credits or plastic credits or, and, as long as you can find a market, you know, with all this, start with first principles is my advice. There's a lot of hype. There's a lot of incentive for people creating the protocol, you know, to build big liquidity pools and promise the moon. But there has, there always has to be a market dynamic at play to make something worth value. And so I think a lot of the aspirations to tokenize positive impact ultimately will come down to find buyers and mechanisms for, uh, for creating a value in the market for those impacts. Um, but it is a really inspiring future, and that's something that a guy gives we're looking to, to integrate, but I'll, I'll get into that uh, in a little bit later here. Um, and when it comes to regenerative finance as a whole, I strongly suggest checking, uh, checking out uh, Green Pill, How Crypto Can Regenerate the Earth uh, by Kevin Owaki. Um, He also has a fantastic podcast, the, the Green Pill podcast, where he brings in you know, leaders in the regenerative finance space. That said, it's, I mean, it's kind of fantastic that it's such a new space as well. It's still being defined. Uh, y Combinator put out um, some, you know, Y Combinator, the perhaps the most prestigious um, uh, tech incubator in the Bay Area, put out a call that they're looking for Web3 carbon projects. So it's definitely caught the attention of the mainstream. And to give you an idea, like when it comes to typical carbon markets, you know, maybe an organization wants to offset their carbon footprint. Typically, they go to a, a bank, which then finds a broker, which then goes to a carbon market and selects them, brings it back, takes a cut, which can be as much as 50%. Then it goes to the bank, and you have not a great understanding of where those carbon credits came from. And if they're actually, is it a pine plantation or is this like regenerative forestry that's benefiting indigenous communities? And that's one of the big opportunities I see with this space is to create more direct connections between people who are trying to put their money to doing good and, and actually understanding the impact and maximizing that. Um, so, and also the 50% cut from those brokers is a massive opportunity. So you can, um, so what, I think that's why there's a lot of capital going into carbon focused Web3 projects. It's so like Toucan uh, is perhaps like the leader in the space. They're building a decentralized framework um, for a, a protocol for others to build on top of, and they have a pretty robust grants program. So if any of you are uh, interested in getting deeper into that carbon space, definitely look at um, Toucan and the work they're doing. There's also some other one, uh, like Senkin uh, has gotten a lot of traction, beautiful user interface. I'm a little out of my depth when it comes to the carbon markets, to be honest, but I think that's, a, that's probably like 50% of the refi space. So I wanna do that justice because it's a really unique opportunity. Um, the other side of refi, I think, is a bit more experimental, which is around like collective coordination over goods. So you can have, I mean, Gitcoin's done a great job with um, using, uh, who here is familiar with Gitcoin? I think it might be big enough that it, I don't want to be preaching to the choir. Checking the chat. Well, uh, I won't waste, so in short, Gitcoin, Gitcoin is you know, of uh, a project of GitHub looking at basically raising collective pools of financing that then are allocated by the community using a mechanism called quadratic voting. And so um, every vote in the early stage is actually worth in some ways more than one vote. So it gives larger projects more. So you donate, your money gets matched maybe 2.5X or 5X for the first $10. And then this, this quadratic curve plays out so that if you give $10,000, that's not getting multiplied 5X, it might only be multiplied by 50%. Um, and so it's a way for using match funding uh, in a more egalitarian way to support a wider variety of projects and lets people with less liquidity put uh, still have their voices be heard and their voting preferences. 
And I think that's a lot of where Web3 as a whole is going. So we're, we're seeing the problems of um, pay for influence. Uh, so sorry if I'm going in tangents, but I'm so stoked to have the opportunity to, to kvetch about, the, about my, my feelings on the future refi. Um, you know, a, a lot of these early protocols made it so that, yeah, you come in, you can come in as a whale and you can get massive uh, voting rights and ownership. But from a first principles perspective, their incentives are not necessarily aligned with the future of the project and nor did they necessarily contribute that much. And so one of the big questions that a lot of people are trying to bridge now in, in collective coordination is how do we um, build reputation systems that give people who may not be so wealthy uh, give them more agency and voting rights and the ability to direct the project. Um, and, and I personally feel like, you know, liquidity is important. Having a treasury to do something with is important, but the community is just, if not more important. Uh, and people are really contributing their, their energy need to be valued more. This is actually something that I was picking Manu's brain on or from, from GitHub back in Barcelona. This idea that like, yeah, there should probably be some sort of reputational NFTs and a way uh, within the DAO of voting with your reputation having a lot, potentially a lot more influence than the money that you've put into the project. Or maybe those are different sorts of voting rights. And that's kind of the joy of all of this is we can make whatever we can dream up, but we shouldn't be naive either. Um, and that we should always be coming back to first principles and not to take lightly. I mean, we've seen over the last few months when, I mean, especially with, with the Terra Luna fiasco, that if enough people, like everyone could admit it was a Ponzi scheme. It was like, but look at all the capital going into it. Like, come on, like uh, uh, three arrows and galaxy and all these people are throwing money in. Like there's, I mean, 26 APR, a percent APR, like it's not sustainable for now. But we'll figure it out later. And um, I really encourage people, especially if you're looking at the future of regenerating the earth and not just making quick cash. Like we need to create projects that can scale for like seven years, 20 years. I like, and sometimes that means um, you have to pass the marshmallow test. I'm familiar with this children early age, if they can resist eating a marshmallow for two minutes, they're much more likely to have to like go to college and have success in their life. And I think, especially in this crypto winter, that's what we're going to see the projects that are not going to do like short-term liquidity grabs and actually build community and build a real product and long-term following are the ones that are really going to, to go places in the next couple of years. Um, yeah, so that's, that's kind of like my broad thoughts on refi. Ch check out the, uh, the refi podcast uh, as well, uh, similar to the green pill, um, fantastic speakers. And if, if you want to go down this, this route of web three for social change, I think it's a really exciting time to be getting into it. Um, yeah. So on that note, let me tell you about Gaia gives and what we're up to. Um, see pulling up the presentation in the meantime, anyone have any questions on what I talked about? Feel free to chime in. All right, all right. Oh, let's see the chat. Okay, yeah, not seeing anything. So I'll, all right, I'll jump into the presentation. Oh no. <laughs> this is a new computer. So uh, I may have to re jump off the call and restart Zoom. My apologies, everyone. <laughs> all right, I'll be back in, in 20 seconds.
Matt, if you're speaking, I cannot hear you. You're muted. Matt, you're muted. Um, are you aware of it? Matt, could you? Okay. You should be able to unmute. I. Okay. 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 Awesome. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I'm live. All right. So, thank okay. you. Uh, technical difficulties. Thanks everyone for, for sticking in there. Uh, all right. So I'll bring this down here. So in a nutshell, Guy gives, I mean, our ultimate goal is to connect donors to their impact. And we see it as a massive opportunity and I'll explain why. So first we're focused not on traditional philanthropy, as you can probably tell from this point, like we're not a, a typical startup. And so we're focusing on younger donors, people like myself. And you don't typically think about millennials, particularly in the US context, we don't think about millennials as philanthropists, but I think that might be changing and it might make some real waves. Um, so something that most people don't realize is that people my age in the next 10 years are scheduled to inherit the largest amount of wealth, the largest wealth transfer essentially in history, aside from like wars and things like that. And it could really shake things up. Um, or as baby boomer parents pass on, um, it's going to be young people for the first time actually having in the States uh, economic resources, but they're not like their parents. They value, they have different values. Um, so across the board in philanthropy, we're seeing that donors in general want to see more of about where their money's going, what impact it's making. As you can see here, 65% of donors would give more if they knew that impact. So we see that as like a blue ocean opportunity here. A lot of people aspire to give, but when it actually comes down to putting money where their mouth is, you know, often we, we feel disempowered and questioning, is it really making a difference? Um, so for people like myself and my generation, uh, first we, we distrust large institutions. It's just a reality. It's like we've seen the, and we're a US, at least we're focused in the US. So I'm gonna be talking from a US perspective, but I think a lot of these trends apply globally as well. Like the reality, we're, um, people my age are twice as likely to follow up on their donations, find out what, what came of them. And in large, like we wanna see the results. We know that branding, you can throw beautiful branding on something. We wanna see the real deal. Um, we also want that to be more than just copywriting and headlines. We wanna know who's behind the project and start developing uh, a deeper relationship with organizations and have it be more of a, a conversation than just a transactional exchange. And then the reality is people my age we're also very much influenced by the actions of our peers and what we see going on in the background, like, or what's, but what's the cultural zeitgeist of the time. And when we see others like us giving, it helps us um, see a cause as relevant. And so we posi we're positioning ourselves as the first platform that really helps make change more tangible to help excite people with better storytellings and better mechanisms for giving that could hopefully make some, like some, a really, uh, make a big difference. And it's ultimately the goal is to put money where um, it can make the most impact and ultimately inspire. So for NGOs, you know, we're, we help them ultimately gain trust and tap this millennial market that's relatively small now, but growing. Um, and we've created new incentives using basically a proto web three approach that allows donors to have uh, get to have an upside for sharing their favorite projects. 
And it also allows smaller nonprofits that may be doing great work, but are not so well financed, allow them to show off their track record. And we also put, give, put hands on uh, marketing support towards every project, help them curate their listings. So we see ourselves as like kind of a mentorship incubator of positive social change organizations and allow them to demonstrate the records that they can potentially get more funding from other locations and show new donors what they, uh, you know, a more tangible, solid track record. So if the whole formula for us starts with, uh, we're very selective. It's about finding remarkable projects. I'm gonna say remarkable, it's, I'm not just saying it. I'm, we want projects that when you see it, you actually wanna tell someone. Um, so even though, you know, I'm a big, you know, I, we need to address tuberculosis, we need to address malaria and sanitation, our initial focus is on trying to basically recontextualize giving for young people, which means we need sexy projects, pardon my, my language, but we need projects that turn heads and make people double take. And so we're putting a particular focus on social justice initiatives, looking at immigration um, technology that uh, disruptive technology that can benefit the environment. Uh, the next round of organizations we're targeting deal with prison reform in the US, uh, indigenous rights, um, like uh, Afro creativity, uh, permaculture. So we're really honing in on this niche of not just delivering for basic needs, but finding projects that get people inspired that there is hope for a better future. Um, and at the core of our structure, um, we have, we're, it's all about storytelling and transparency. So when organizations have a number of projects, but each of those projects have to be broken down into tangible milestones. And those milestones include, you know, uh, some idea of like what the budget is, what they're trying to go for, what the final impact metrics are. And then they were required to report on it. Like I, I didn't mention in my bio, but I've worked on the grounds. Like I worked for my startup in coordination with the UN Foundation uh, to test solar cooking technology in Guatemala for about a year. And it was one of the most difficult times of my life uh, you know, to actually do good is surprisingly challenging. So we wanna create a flexible framework that brings donors along for the storytelling, including, including the mistakes, including the messes. I think for young donors being transparent and vulnerable will actually have much more of a long-term long positive impact and is much more in alignment with our Web3 ethos. Um, we we, th we want radical transparency and honesty to be upfront, even when we make mistakes. Um, so a lot of um, what's missing in the philanthropic space right now is, I think, connecting their impact to tangible projects that donors can, can benefit. So we've created um, an impact feed on our site that allows donors to see what has actually become of their money. And it's not like an Instagram, it may look a lot like Instagram, but we're positioning this more as a place for vulnerable stories that you may not put on other social media channels. Since it's in context of a very specific project and milestone, we're encouraging the directors of projects or the stakeholders on the ground to grab a cell phone and just start recording, throw up selfie videos, throw up whatever it takes to start making a, a more vulnerable real story. I don't want to see beautiful marketing. I want to see like real on the ground impact. Uh, and as a prototype of our of our eventual decentralization and, and token economy launch, we're starting simple. As I mentioned, I'm I'm a uh, I'm an entrepreneur from a more traditional background, so I want to test product market fit. I want to test incentives before putting things on chain. And while we're lean and centralized, it makes it much more easy to pivot and find out what really connects with the community. So we've created a points economy that rewards donors three points for every dollar donated and one point for every uh, dollar brought in through one of their links. So we've created essentially a whole of, of affiliate tracking system that any donor can jump into and start earning these points. You're probably asking if these aren't tokens, they're not liquid, what can you do with these points? Um, for now, every point enters donors into a site-wide raffle. So currently, if you the raffle is to join us in Costa Rica in February, go uh, go snorkeling, cacao ceremony. You get to hang out with the team of it. Um, that in time, we'll also expand these points to be exchangeable uh, for branded merchandise and swag. I mean, part of the, the idea for this came as I was giving to Greenpeace for like five years and I've heard on essentially nothing back. 
It's as if they don't want to remind me that I'm giving until I get a phone call asking for me to up my donation. And I've had friends who work for Greenpeace and I know if they don't get, if they don't get someone to at least, you know, up their donation, they have to land like five to 10 people a day to keep their job. So I felt bad. I gave another $5 a month, but I was like, this, this doesn't feel clean. I'd like to develop, like I would be, I'd like there to be more clear incentives and ways for us to participate. And so this is an approach at that. Um, and then ultimately these points we see expanding into a token economy once we test the concept and see how it works, they'll likely transfer into token at some point. But as I mentioned earlier, we have to start with first principles. And I think a, a lot of people are a little too cavalier these days with just launching a token economy and then we'll figure it out later. Um, so you might get a lot of liquidity at the front end, but then you're locked into a structure where we want to figure out like what really works with the ultimate goal of expanding beyond the Web3 community. I mean, Web3 is, is still niche and I think it is the future, but it, it's going to take us creating technology that can be more easily adopted by people like our parents or our grandparents, I think for us to really see mass adoption. And that's what, that's one of our ultimate goals. Let's see, uh, we have a global team completely remote. Our two main um, hubs are probably Berlin and Costa Rica, uh, but we're, we're always traveling about. Maxim, who unfortunately couldn't make it on this call, is our, our CEO and director of, of uh, he's our, our main like networker. I'm head of product and marketing. Um, so this the platform is a bit my baby. If, by the way, I realized I haven't actually told you the URL. If you wanna look this up while I'm talking about it, it's gaia.gives. Um, so yeah, take a look, see if my this presentation lives up to the reality. Uh, but we have a pretty all-star team. Arco, our head of global impact, is the head of fundraising for the largest NGO in the Netherlands. So he understands how it works at an institutional level, including the rot and the obfuscation and the uh, you know the dark side. Like a lot of larger NGOs don't want transparency. They like having fat operating budgets. They like um, having, you know, they're having that ability to, um, to move money around. And that's something that he's really trying to push against having seen it from the inside. Um, our CTO is, is a skilled tech entrepreneur who's had a few exits. So he's been creating a platform that can really scale. And then all this presentation you see is the work of Gil. He's our creative director. He also did the branding for Prime DAO. Colectivo, uh, the Taoist. So he is, and he's also one of the main leaders of um, of uh, Regions Unite, which I strongly suggest if you can find a Regions Unite, that is really the hub of, I see the future of, of regenerative finance because you have people from permaculture, global health, um, people looking at like soil science, disruptive technology coming into the fold with Web3. And I think that's really where the exciting part is, is where do these overlap and can we create use Web3 structures to piggyback and scale the great work that other people are already doing? But I'll see, I'll move on. At the core of what we're 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 trying trying to do is stick to our principles. The project's certainly going to change. We we launched a week ago and we've learned so much just in the last week. But at the core of it, we want to create a regenerative future in line with uh with the the values that are going to be required to, to make that possible. Um, so as I alluded to earlier, our ultimate goal is to decentralize, uh, our community. Uh, so right now we're a central private entity connected to an impact investment fund to issue tax deductions, but we've intentionally set up in Wyoming with the goal of moving into a DAO structure, um, certainly within the next two years, but we're intentionally keeping things centralized for now to, to be able to pivot, um, uh, too many cooks in the kitchen sometimes like web3 communities can do a great job of that and i encourage you know, if there are small projects that are more that are more fit for that like jump in um, but for us it made sense in in our growth curve to to start more centralized and we're seeing these next uh, these next six months is really a learning period so we're going to launch this impact marketplace that allows donors to spend their points we're going to look at um, point gated match funding so finding uh, partners like UBS, for example, is on board and we'll be uh, adding match funding here shortly, but we might require some of those Gaia points to unlock the match funding. Um, and then ultimately, what, when it comes time to scale, we're going to 
um, unlock this token economy and do it in a way that's much more informed. Um, yeah, and uh, not shown here in this presentation, but I'll describe it verbally. Our token economy, we're looking to essentially do uh, hold a liquidity owned protocol. So we will be using hard assets to back up um, a good portion of our tokens that will give much more price stability. Uh, we'll then uh, be using, uh, with our treasury, creating yield off of that using pretty conservative DeFi approaches. So, so probably, um, um, I believe, yearn, so like we'll, we'll make it public to the community how we're making yield. But then those, uh, that treasury will then be allocated to impact projects on the platform you know, through a collective voting process. So there could be plastic recycling projects in Guatemala or um, tree planting in Madagascar. And we set up these projects with token verifying um, credit issuing entities. So we have a relationship with Open Forest Protocol, which is issuing uh, carbon credits at a much smaller scale using new techniques for uh, impact monitoring, reporting, and verification. Super cool project, basically making tokenized impact accessible to, to people around the world who, you know, typical carbon credits, you have to spend at least like 100,000 plus to go through the international regulation process. And you have to have broad acreage of land where this brings it and down to earth. So smaller like permaculture designers or villages and emerging markets can actually have access to these financing mechanisms. So that's one. And then the plastics protocol um, is issuing a plastic uh, a plastic recycling token that's backed by impact. So we'll take those tokens then and uh, and put them back into the treasury. So now we actually have some form of collateral to back the treasury. And then that can create more yield and back more impact. So we want to create this virtuous cycle of impact, you know, putting our, uh, putting impact, uh, what's the metaphor? I want to say put money where our mouth is, but to like, not to, to actually walk the walk and leverage the treasury and in a scalable way to make to make good things happen. So yeah, that's that's what I got for the presentation. I also pulled up um, uh, some resources that that could be helpful here. Um, I did put together a manifesto at one point, and this is just something to to think about. Um, if if you're really thinking about the future of Web three, I think it helps to go back to the literature and look at technology adoption theory. I spent a year and a half trying to get people in Central America to use solar cooking technology, and it never really caught on. But I learned a lot in the process. And I think one of the, the biggest nuggets is the diffusion of innovations theory um, by um, Everett Rogers. And within it, they, there's actually a framework for how technology spreads. And this is pretty well validated um, by, by broad research. So you need to have a relative advantage that's that gives it's like what's the ultimate reason for using this there has to be some advantage and i think web3 actually has that pretty solidly like in cases of coordination it can be a very um elegant and creates a lot of new opportunities but i think when, when it comes to compatibility with the existing values experiences and needs this is where we're running into a public relations crisis in scaling web3 where it's still very abstract and many people i'm sure many of our friends and family are telling us hey th these are ponzi schemes it's all scams and like give the devil its due, there's been a lot of like opportunistic cash grabs. But on the other hand, if we can create something that is more harmonious with people's values and life experiences, I think that's what's what's re really going to help help to shift adoption. Also, within a lot of these uh, these programs, you know, we use even terms like liquidity owned protocol or staking. We need to go back to the drawing board to make that to try to find. I think in some places. Uh, nomenclature and language that actually fits with how people see the world already. So that's why we named instead of the Gaia, Gaia token or whatever, we just called it points. I asked my mom, like, what, how about a credit card? She was totally opposed to a, uh, a, a, a token, but I was like, what if they're like credit card points, frequent flyer miles? That's something my mom could get behind. And I think that's how we have to start thinking if we, if we want to see mass scale adoption. And if any of you are entrepreneurs on this or looking at launching your own yeah, keep that in mind. Like, bring get out of the get out of the the crypto Twitter bubble and and think like, what? How would a person from the outside view this? There's also a re reality of trialability, you know. So if you can easily grab one and and feel the results and the upsides yourself, you're much more likely to adopt. 
where in most cases in Web3, you have to actually throw money on a wallet. You have to connect the MetaMask. You have to know how everything works before you can actually try out. And then there's often a big latency of a few weeks that then uh, before you actually see any yields or returns. So if we can create something that instantly gives value, that will also make a big difference. And finally, like, can you actually observe what, what's going on? Do you understand the mechanisms enough? And like, yeah, we have Etherscan, but I don't think that cuts, uh, that, that really cuts it when it comes to understanding the mechanisms. And so I think like way, new ways of visualizing and expressing what's really going on with them, be it the structure of a DAO or the structure of, of staking rewards will really benefit us in the long run. I know this isn't what you asked me to present on, but this is what I want to present on. So thank you for bearing with me. Um, cool. So yeah, I'm, I'm down to take some questions. Stoked to be here. Um, yeah, let's, let's jump in. Thank you so much, Matt, for this wonderful presentation. Actually, we do already have some questions from some people here in the chat. So mm -hmm. first one is from Lana Jack. Wilmer and uh, Lonnie Singh. I love what I'm hearing. It, it also makes sense. It also makes me wonder what strategies are you using to bring millennials from BIPOC communities to join your team, ass assuring that there are diverse voices at the governance table? Oh, absolutely. That's actually one of our... So we're a small startup. Like you see the, the team, but of actual... There are only three of us that are on salaries, so it's just a matter right now of just getting enough scale so that we can actually pay to bring talent in. Um, that said, uh, the, as I mentioned, the first, the, our next focus for onboarding projects will be focused on relevant topics and BIPOC communities. Like our one of the project we have live now is looking at economies uh, set in Kenya with grassroots economics, creating a community voucher for the LGBTQI community there. Um, but within our internal team, you know, it's kind of a reality of startups. Like we, sometimes you just, you have to run with the people you have, but I would love to have some more diverse voices. Uh, for a little while there, it was primarily white guys. And at least we, we have some women on our team now. And um, yeah, I'm, but it is, it is a problem. It's something that you know, in, in recruiting that we want to take seriously said so to recruit, we need to have, to have cash. So, uh, but it's a, it's a really legitimate question. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lana, for this wonderful question. Um, Ganesh as well asked, what is the impact of carbon credits in a web-free economy? Ooh, yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a broad question. I think I'm, maybe I'll reframe it, like the web, the web3, what is the impact of the web3 carbon credit economy on the world? Because um, I think having lower priced, more liquid carbon markets were, is going to really help move impact. Like, why would I buy through a bank and this broker for some hidden carbon credit when like Toucan has much more, like a much more elegant interface and then open forest protocol could put, you know, its verification monitoring data on Toucan. And, and now I have this whole suite of chain verified data that I can go back and I can actually see photographs if I want to of this in Madagascar and opens up unique opportunities for uh, connecting you know, people purchasing the credits to seeing their impact. Um, but I think perhaps the most revolutionary part of it is just making those credits accessible. Because um, carbon, I mean, carbon does have a decent price. And if you're doing broad scale, like Centropic, agroforestry, uh, you could actually like significantly subsidize your operation just with carbon credits, um, but not if it's hundred thousand dollars and requires a global, you know, a bunch of global bureaucracy to to move through it. Uh, also, on a broad scale, like part of what Toucan did initially was they were purchasing lower end carbon credits intentionally to push the global price of carbon up, which is a really unique strategy. <laughs> Trying to like basically push the whole world market up by taking off all these junk credits. Detractors would say, well, now you just, you know, we have took all these like low quality credits off the market. You know, where did all of our money and the liquidity pool go? But on the other hand, the broad social impact of that is going to mean, yeah, like just a higher price for carbon overall and more benefit for those making change. Great questions. Amazing, Matt. Um, 
Also, I'd like to invite uh, if anyone wants to open up their microphone and maybe share some thoughts or ask a question, just raise your hand so I can unmute you. Is there anyone that would like to open up their microphone? Just raise your hand. Okay, no one? Okay, so... No. Um, and guys, also, if you have any more questions, do um, write them in the chat. And I'm curious, um, Matt, uh, what has been your um, experience working in the refi space? And could you just as well tell us a bit about like the broader refi landscape and where yeah, everything is at at the moment? Oh, wow. Well, this is a hard thing to even capture. It's moving so fast. There's new protocols coming up. I mean, there was a lot of emphasis on NFTs for good and collectibles. I think a lot of those projects have, in this crypto winter, kind of hit a, a growth uh, of challenges growing their communities. Um, and public sentiment right now is kind of at an all-time low with FTX. And the, it's particularly in the States, the political ramifications of FTX, a lot of people in the left wing are, are now hesitant. Uh, and Trump launched his NFT. So like, it's in some ways, I see the refi space is trying to provide an apolitical alternative, but often those voices get get um, undermined by you know sixty billion dollars getting lost, or <laughs> like there's bigger headlines than the more tangible impact that people like Open Forest Protocol are making. And it's really impre impressive to see these systems at work. Now it's kind of I see in part of it's a it's going to be a public relations battle. But I think the the cooler heads in Silicon Valley haven't they haven't lost their interest. As I mentioned, Y Combinator is still looking to back um, on chain carbon. Uh, I think there's a lot of long term strategies that in the next couple of years will start making refi more of a voice. Um, that said, if you want to be tuned in, the two podcasts I mentioned, the the Green Pill podcast and the Refi podcast, are great. The Refi uh, community also has a really fantastic discord full of resources they're having weekly meetings so if you want to get active it's it's a it's a really vibrant community amazing thank you so much mm -hmm. Ahmed, for sharing this um and mm -hmm. i see also um there's another question coming from the um i'm sorry if i'm not pronouncing your name correctly so uh she's asking what strategy did you use to build community how did you start the conversations? Yeah, I mean, part of the community building, we went to a lot of in-person events. That's farther out, even though it's all decentralized, going to DevCon or, or to any of the global ETH events is a, is a really powerful way to figure out who's behind the projects. So at some level, like, the, yeah, you can never totally know. And the, you can see great actions. You can see reputation. But there's nothing like being at a real Web3 event. Um, we've also, I mean, in some ways we haven't done the best job of building a web three community. I think if we, at one point we we're looking at building a DAO and getting and trying to really start decentralized, uh, but we realized it's not our, our strong suit. And if we were really aiming to get a larger audience into web three, starting with a more traditional approach off chain with this point system that will then decentralize would give us, and so the there's the downside is we lose the web3 community you know there's no there's no collective ownership or staking rewards but on the positive side we have a much larger market that we can approach and then bring them into the web3 fold so is it ultimately a strategic gamble um that said i we're really we're looking in the next few months to build something like a brain dow so to bring active community members together to help us direct the future of the project um but yeah that's I wish that I had a more elegant answer, but the reality was um, for our business model, it, it didn't in some sense make, it made more sense to go after the web two audience first. Hey, thank you. Thank you for sharing this. Um, and um, someone asked, what is the connection between your project and the free? So here, like, um, maybe I would rephrase the question here and just, um, so what is the, um, what the free allows um, in Gaia gives that would not be possible otherwise. 
Yeah, sure. A lot of people when they hear that we're using Web3 think, well, oh, you want to track payments overseas and make sure payments made it to the bank accounts. That's not really the problem in philanthropy. The problem is after the money hits the bank account, how is it allocated? And short of us having a credit card, like we're looking you know, in our roadmap, we may have a specific spending account where that's made public, where the, the dollars from Guy gives are allocated and all the transactions are visible. But the reality is if you're doing a focus group and you need to buy fruit, you're gonna need cash. They're not going to be accepting a credit card. So for us, the Web3 emphasis is much more on community ownership and how projects in the future are curated for the platform. So essentially token holders, at least our, our mind's eye would be the ones choosing the projects that come onto the platform. They'd be helping allocate where the treasury funds go to which impact projects. And then there would be some form of staking rewards um, for backing. So, and, and that could take a number of forms. Those rewards could be like match funding that's unlocked with staking on specific projects that you believe in. But unlike, I mean, we still wanna have an upside, but unlike other protocols, we're ultimately a giving platform. We wanted to have like some give backs and some, posit and, and some positive return on the money you're putting in, but ultimately it is about like generosity and giving. So if you're looking to come to Guy Gives to make like fast returns, it's, that's not gonna be our token economy. Even within our, our bonding curve, we're pro probably going to take a more conservative approach so that we can build something for the long run. I mean, want this to be around seven years from now. I don't want the token to just explode in value and pump and dump. Um, so from those first principles, it might mean it's a less exciting token economy in some ways, but then it's backed up by like a lot of real tangible impact and great stories. Amazing. Yeah. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. Right. Do we have any more questions? Again, if anyone wants to open up their microphone. These are good. These are good cutting questions. <laughs> uh, this is great. And, and maybe also if someone wants to connect with you um, and maybe ask some question um, afterwards, if something comes up, like where could they find you? Yeah, sure. So I'm also on Telegram. I'll throw it into the chat. I'm at that Matt G. And then I'll throw in... Uh, I'll throw in my email, which is matt at gaia.giz. And I have a, I have, I see it looks like there's a lot of people from around the world here too. So I'll have a call to action to, to you all that if you know of remarkable impact projects, shoot them my way. Like we're putting together, we actually have an online course going live for like medium sized NGOs that will, it's a six week course that's free. Um, that gu guides them in developing their communication strategy and marketing. We're just looking for exceptional projects. As I mentioned, it, it's really about intersection of impact. So anyone working with like marginalized communities or regenerative techniques or new technology. Um, yeah, like if you have any interesting projects, let me know and uh, we, we'd be really happy to consider. Okay, amazing, amazing. So. Um, also, Tanin is asking, uh, so how do we find uh, um, a bit more about this six-week program? Yeah, I'll throw a link to it in the chat. You can uh, feel, you feel free to, to sign up for notifications there. Um, it's, it's taught by Arco Hundert, the um, head of fundraising for, that, for the largest uh, charity in the Netherlands. So I think it should be a, it should be a really solid course. I'm putting, I'm gonna be recording some videos as part of it as well. And the idea is really, how do you how do you gear up to tap into the millennial donor audience in the States and, and play on their terms? And the good news is it's actually, part of the core elements of it is just being authentic to yourself and really showing up. Uh, don't try to pretend to be someone else, but find your unique voice and own it. Hey, thank you, yeah. thank you. And then Bye. our site is, uh, Gaia.giz. Sorry, probably should have given that up front. <laughs> so check it out there. And hey, if you want to donate $5, um, as I mentioned, we launched one week ago. So every donation really right now really does help show traction. And uh, there'll be more pro new projects coming on every week. So that's kind of our thing, like curating stellar impact. So I, I hope it'd be inspiring if you, if you join the community. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, that sounds really, really inspiring already. And uh, um, now just like the final, the final uh, moment, if there's uh, another question before we mm -hmm. finish, but um, yeah, but I think otherwise, um, thank you very much, Matt, for joining um, the call today, like last minute. <laughs> and, oh, my uh, pleasure. <laughs> it was a, a great presentation. I'm sure people learned a lot about your great work and about refi space in general. Um, it's so it's the best part of Web three. Really, if you're if you're interested in doing in doing some good, the potential to have like positive economic upside and positive social impact is nothing like Web three. Mm, absolutely. Yeah, I see you, Emma. <laughs> Okay, uh, so Matt, have a great Christmas um, and everyone else as well, uh, but we still have another um, demo session tomorrow before uh, we go into the Christmas time, but um, yeah, everyone have a, have a lovely um, evening or day ahead and then uh, we'll, we'll see each other soon. Bye-bye. Take care, y'all.